thoughts and prayers who are the first of many. FEMA has had its hand full for the past several years. After having uh, not been hit by a major hurricane in over a decade, Hurricane Wilma in 2005, 2017 devastated the United States with three major hurricanes, Harvey, Irma, and Maria. And it doesn't seem like things have slowed down since. In 2018, Hurricane Michael made landfall in the Florida Panhandle, becoming the first Category 5 storm to hit the United States since Hurricane Andrew in 1992. 2019 also saw an above average hurricane season with 18 named storms. And 2020, although it was somewhat overshadowed by COVID-19, was the most active and the fifth costliest Atlantic hurricane season on record. Not to mention record breaking fire seasons over the past several years. In 2020 alone, more than 4 million acres were burned in the state of California. And then came COVID. On March 13, 2020, President Trump declared a nationwide emergency and eventually every state, Commonwealth, territory, and the District of Columbia received a major disaster declaration. That triggers FEMA, of course. And during that pandemic, FEMA, with the help of HHS and the private sector, coordinated, coordinated the delivery of more than 600 million N95 respirators, 2.5 billion surgical masks, 131 million face shields, 1.1 billion surgical gowns and coveralls, and more than 56 billion gloves to state, local, tribal, and territory partners. Well done, well done indeed. And additionally, FEMA has distributed more than $80 billion in COVID relief and vaccine-related expenses. They've helped to support 2,100 community vaccination centers and assisted in the delivery of more than 371 million vaccines. I applaud the work of FEMA, all the work FEMA has done over the past several years and during the pandemic. These are certainly unprecedented times for our country and for FEMA. Despite the many successes of FEMA during 2020 and before, I think that FEMA is facing multiple challenges today and will in the years to come. With the many varying undertakings that FEMA has been given, including now a mission at the border, we must ensure that we have an adequately staffed, well-trained and forward-thinking FEMA that is not only prepared for hurricanes, but for whatever challenges lie ahead. So think about it for a moment, if you will. It's the first time in FEMA's history that had a nationwide emergency disaster declaration. And that I'm sure changed the matrix of things quite a bit for FEMA. I, I have concerns with FEMA's readiness as well as approach to dealing with state, local, territorial, and tribal entities. And we'll highlight one of my experiences later in my opening statement. But first I would like to note that I, what I hope to hear in your testimony today, among other things, I would like to hear your vision for the following. How will, how will you ensure that FEMA is adequately staffed for future disasters due to staff burnout and massive workload, as I detailed earlier in my testimony. How will FEMA revamp the recovery process, which is outdated, frustrating for applicants, too bureaucratic, and simply takes too long? How does FEMA plan to view grants moving forward? And does FEMA think any changes should be made as we approach the 20th anniversary of 9-11? What role can FEMA grants play in showing up, shoring up the security of communities who have defunded law enforcement critical to the Homeland Security mission? How does FEMA view its role in future pandemics? Should FEMA be the lead or should FEMA play a support role? How does FEMA plan to modernize the flood insurance program? What are the future plans for FEMA's BRIC program? And how will you ensure that this program is truly the transformational program that Congress envisioned? I'm also interested in how FEMA will do more to work with small and rural communities. Not all of us represent large metropolitan areas and I have seen FEMA fall flat when it comes to working with smaller communities in central New York. And I know that my experience is not unique. As I'm sure you are aware, President Trump signed a major disaster declaration for multiple counties in New York due to flooding along Lake Ontario in 2017. Unfortunately, assistance for individuals was denied under this declaration. Similar flooding occurred in 2019 and FEMA Administrator Gaynor visited the region with me to survey the devastating damage, which amounted to hundreds of millions of dollars of shoreline damage at a minimum. I disagree with the decision by FEMA and how these requests for assistance were handled. My constituents were left frustrated by the length of time it took for a decision and the overall lack of transparency in the process. Additionally, I take issue with the process of FEMA's preliminary damage assessments. To improve this process for my constituents and others, I introduced a bill that will improve the efficiency and consistency of the PDA process. My bill establishes an advisory panel of state and local emergency personnel from all 10 FEMA regions to work with FEMA to enhance the PDA process. In 2020, a previous version of this legislation was passed by the House of Representatives. 
with overwhelming bipartisan support. Ms. Criswell, on behalf of my constituents, I would ask that you look at this legislation and provide any uh, meaningful feedback that you think is, met, is uh, helpful. FEMA plays an important role in the Department of Homeland Security. Indeed, it plays a critical role. It has a zero fail mission. It needs to be able to respond to disasters at any hour of any day and across the entire United States from Puerto Rico to Samoa. Ms. Criswell, my two hearings with the Secretary, I have told him that I want to be a constructive member of Congress, not just throw bombs without offering solutions. I would like to make the same offer to you and be forward looking. I look forward to working with you. And I know based on my conversations with you already, we will be able to work together. And I look forward to hearing your testimony today and your vision for FEMA. Now I did have some criticisms, but of course, there's many things about FEMA that are doing well. And the last thing I wanna say is, I want to salute the men and women of FEMA who have gone above and beyond the duty during this pandemic and have done yeoman's work to, uh, to uh, help us get through this pandemic. So. I salute all of them, and I think on behalf of the entire committee, they will agree with me that they did a fantastic job. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back to you. Thank you very much. Other members of the committee are reminded that under the committee rules, opening statements may be submitted for the record. Members are also reminded that the committee will operate according to the guidelines laid out by the chairman and ranking member in our February 3rd colloquy regarding remote procedures. I welcome our witness. Um, and I'm gonna try to get your first name right. Uh, Dean. Deanne. Deanne. Deanne Criswell, the administrator for the Federal Emergency Management Agency, who is making her first appearance before the committee today. Without objection, administrator's full statement will be inserted in the record. I now ask the administrator Pritwell to summarize a statement of five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair Thompson, Ranking Member Katko, and members of the committee. I am delighted to appear before you today to discuss the President's budget request for FEMA in fiscal year 2022, and to describe how the President's vision guides my priorities for the agency. Uh, this past Sunday, I visited Surfside, Florida, in the scene of the Champlain Towers collapse. And it's difficult to put into words the devastation that this community is experiencing. And our hearts go out to all the families and loved ones that have been impacted by this event. I am very grateful for the heroic efforts of the local first responders seeing firsthand the around-the-clock rescue efforts and how the community has come together in their time of greatest need. FEMA is on the ground. We have a recovery center that is working directly with families and loved ones impacted by this tragic event to get them the assistance that they need. And we will continue to bring resources to support the ongoing response and recovery efforts. FEMA's mission of supporting people before, during, and after disasters has never been more critical. Our role supporting incidents such as the Champlain Towers collapse, our support of the COVID-19 pandemic response, and numerous other active disasters attests to the vital importance and responsibility of this agency to our nation. Given FEMA's unprecedented mission requirements, the president's budget increases the FEMA budget to $28.4 billion, which is 1.9 billion more than the fiscal year 2021 enactment. The president's budget, if enacted, will allow FEMA to meet the challenges ahead. In my first months as FEMA administrator, I am focused on three key priorities, supporting the FEMA workforce and our readiness, integrating equity into everything we do, and addressing climate change through risk reduction. I will describe these priorities in turn. First, we must support the FEMA workforce and our readiness to protect the well-being of our workforce and the communities we serve in the COVID-19 environment we continue to rely on virtual operations where appropriate. We are evaluating how to enhance our operational capacity, promote an agile and expeditionary culture, and support the safe return to the office. Workforce readiness begins with the right staffing levels. And the fiscal year 22 budget supports increased hiring and among other things would result in a 14% increase in the number of our Stafford Act employees. Readiness also means ensuring the workforce has the training, tools, and resources they need to do their job, and I am committed to providing that to the workforce. 
Next, we must integrate equity into everything we do. The nation deserves to have our programs and services delivered fairly and equitably. To meet this expectation, diversity, equity, and inclusion must be core components of how we conduct ourselves and execute our mission. FEMA is currently soliciting feedback from the public and our partners to ensure we understand how our programs impact survivors of different demographics and where needed, we are committed to making changes. This includes changes to our policies, procedures, and how we deploy and execute our mission. Internally, this means building a diverse and inclusive workforce, which resembles the communities we serve. Externally, it means we must proactively identify and reach out to underserved communities and populations most in need of our help. We are analyzing our operational programs through the lens of equity, and we are doing that for a reason. We know that disasters exasperate existing inequalities, and we need to ensure FEMA assistance reaches everyone who needs it. We must also identify the root causes of differing recovery outcomes for survivors and work aggressively and collectively to ensure access for all to disaster response and recovery assistance. FEMA's commitment to equity is evident in our efforts to advance the accessibility of the COVID-19 vaccine. At the president's direction, FEMA coordinated with federal, state, local, tribal, and territorial partners to support the establishment and expansion of over 2,100 community vaccination centers. This included 39 federally-led CVC pilot sites and the deployment of 18 mobile vaccination units to help reach traditionally underserved populations. Nearly 60% of all doses administered at these federally-led sites went to communities of color. And as we execute our response to COVID-19 and other disasters, FEMA will continue to prioritize equity across all of our operations. And finally, we must address climate change through risk reduction. As emergency managers, we must face the challenges that climate change poses to our mission head on and make generational level investments to reduce the impacts. Developing resilient communities ahead of an incident reduces both the loss of life and economic disruption. Every dollar invested in mitigation saves the American taxpayer $6 in future spending. To provide local partners with the financial support for mitigation projects, FEMA is expanding resources and technical assistance for the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program, which establishes a reliable stream of funding for larger mitigation projects through a nationwide grant program. Recently, the president visited FEMA and announced that he was doubling the funding available for the BRIC program to $1 billion for the fiscal year 21 application. Mitigating the increasing flood risk is particularly important as flooding is the most common and costly natural disaster in the United States. Among other initiatives, the president's fiscal year 22 budget requests more than $428 million for the flood hazard mapping and risk analysis program to allow for climate change data to be incorporated into flood risk analysis. FEMA is also working to ensure that communities are protected financially from flooding. FEMA is updating the National Flood Insurance Program pricing methodology to fix long-standing inequities by more closely aligning insurance premiums to the specific flood risk of each home. The fiscal year 22 budget also includes a means-tested affordability proposal to ensure that everyone who needs flood insurance can afford it. In conclusion, the COVID-19 pandemic is an important turning point for our country and challenges us to rethink our systems, decisions, and investments. This past year has not been easy, and I would like to recognize the professionalism and perseverance demonstrated by the FEMA workforce. I look forward to working with the members of this committee as we build a more ready and resilient nation. I'm happy to answer any questions. I thank the administrator for a testimony. I'll remind each member that he or she will have five minutes to question the witness. I'll now recognize myself uh, for questions. Uh, Madam Administrator, you've talked about the workforce and uh, what you are looking to, to do to uh, enhance it. And obviously, you have a number of working uh, 
disasters ongoing right now. Um, can you just uh, uh, explain to the committee what things you're doing to address worker exhaustion and, and other things that come with being, you know, overtaxed in disasters? Uh, Chair Thompson, uh, our FEMA workforce are some of the best public servants that I believe the U.S. government has, and uh, they have been working continuously um, over the last several years in supporting multiple events, going back to the hurricanes of Harvey, Irma, and Maria in 2017. Um, and what we're seeing is that we no longer have a cycle of um, of a normal seasonal cycle. Uh, our ops tempo, our operational tempo is really consistent around the year. And so the things that we're doing to address that right now is, is we are uh, encouraging everybody uh, to make sure that they are taking time for themselves right now, demobilizing staff from some of the current operations supporting COVID-19 and, and other uh, longstanding recovery disasters. So we can make sure that they are ready for the peak of hurricane season and what is expected to also be a very busy wildfire season. Um, this rotation of readiness to make sure that our staff have the time to take for themselves and reset is a critical part of how we make sure that they are prepared uh, and that we have a workforce that is ready to respond when needed. Thank you very much. Uh, the ranking member alluded to some experiences he had uh, in his area. And I talked about one I'm currently undergoing in, in my district in Mississippi. Uh, that part of my district, primarily rural, um, uh, low to medium income individuals. Uh, have you looked at FEMA's um, structure for declaring uh, and approving natural disasters uh, and weighted based on uh, the population and income of the area. Uh, and what happens is if a high income area gets hit, the disasters will clear. But a sparsely populated uh, rural working class community that's devastated uh, somehow doesn't meet the criteria, the dollar amount. Have you looked at that uh, as to what we can do to make sure that those people are not being uh, left out because of their current economic conditions? You know, I have seen firsthand the uh, disproportionate impact that our communities experience and uh, our underserved communities across this country um, where they struggle day to day, struggle even more exponentially when a disaster does strike. You know, one of the things that we did during COVID-19 for the first time was take social vulnerability index, social uh, vulnerability data into our uh, decision making for how we are going to anticipate um, or provide assistance. And I have directed my team to continue this process and how do we now take this equity data that is out there into the decision making process that we use for future disasters. Um, and that is something that we are working right now to, to figure out how we can institutionalize that so we can really understand the needs of the community as we're making our assessments. Well, I, I appreciate it. And as soon as you can push that information down to state and local so that they understand it too, because they are still operating on the, the, the current thinking uh, and not the new way of thinking addressing disasters. I think it would be very helpful. Yes, sir. I, again, our team and our regional administrators work very closely with our state directors. And as we continue to mature this process of including this equity data into our anal analysis, uh, we will make sure that we're getting that information out to our stakeholders and our customers. Uh, and, and I will, I have a couple other questions out follow up after after the hearing uh, with you on the chair recognizes the ranking member for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for uh, asking that question. I just want to follow up with that and illustrate a few examples to help you understand the gravity of the problem. I have a small town called Moravia, New York, in my district. And it's at the bottom. It's kind of surrounded by hills. 
they had a horrendous rain over a, a long period of time, like eight or nine inches in a, in a relatively quick period of time, and literally destroyed a good section of the town and destroyed their sewer systems and their, 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 their dikes on the roads and everything. And um, it didn't qualify for disaster relief, really, despite the fact that it was uh, to repair everything would cost uh, many times more than their, the town's annual budget. And so that's what I think that, uh, Mr. Thompson's talking about. And another example, Lake Ontario. They've had two catastrophic floods in the last four years. And I think you knew this, because you're a regional administrator up there. Um, those catastrophic floods caused hundreds of millions of damage to uh, lakefront properties and lakefront communities. Yet it didn't, it didn't qualify for disaster declaration. So I would very much like to spend more time on this, perhaps in another setting with the chairman, and maybe you can sit down with us, because this is a very serious problem. And you know, obviously the big communities, expensive communities, the beachfront communities, when a, when a hurricane hits, obviously that's a disaster. But what happens to these small towns from an economic standpoint, the disasters are stunning and they can't recover from them. So I really would like to talk to more about that going forward because I think FEMA should have some flexibility with respect to that. Uh, Ranking Member Katko, the, um, we really have an opportunity right now, you know, as we've learned so much in our response to COVID-19 and, and seeing the impacts that our underserved communities have, I, we do have an opportunity right now to to reflect on that and see what we can do to incorporate better assessment methodologies into the, the way we determine disasters going forward. And so I, I would appreciate the opportunity to continue to have that discussion. Um, I, I recognize that from my time in Colorado as well, uh, where these rural communities uh, have a harder time meeting thresholds. Um, and so happy to continue that conversation um, and learn from what we've uh, experienced over the last few years. Yeah, let, let's do that and let and, and let us know if it's something that can be done through your internal rulemaking or just internal procedures or whether it's something that needs a legislative fix. Because if it's a legislative fix, I'm sure Mr. Thompson and I can craft something together. Um, so thank you. Um, I want to switch gears for a bit and talk about, you know, this nationwide disaster declaration. Because now that it's happened, um, uh, I think it's going to happen again, right, at some point. And, you know, when they start using FEMA for stuff like this, they may use it again more. So I think it's really important that... Uh, uh, the, the initial assessment report that was done in September of 2020 about COVID, uh, has, it, 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 has it been updated? And if it hasn't, I think it's really important that it should be. So can you tell me if there's the initial assessment report from September of 2020 with COVID-19 has been updated at all, or do you plan to update it? Uh, uh, so FEMA did an initial assessment report prior to me getting here that really started to capture what I would call, you know, the initial lessons learned from our response. Uh, we are undergoing a more thorough uh, an assessment of the overall response as far as FEMA's role is concerned. Um, so we will be releasing something um, when that is completed. So what, what, do you have an idea what a timeline is for that? Um, I do not have a timeline for that, but I'm happy to get back to you uh, with what, where we're at in the progress. I think it's going to be important because it was a sea change in how FEMA uh, was implemented nation and was implemented nationwide. And I want to make sure that we're giving you the resources and the tools you need. And we can't have that unless we see a, a candid internal assessment. And I hope that's what we see soon. Um, and lastly, uh, in the hearing uh, with this committee that, uh, on the COVID-19 pandemic in February, one of the witnesses was from my county, Onondaga County Executive Ryan McMahon. And he testified to the struggles that many officials faced. And he specifically testified to the challenge they faced, given the fact that resource allocations pursuant to the disaster declaration in many cases are dictated by the state. And in New York State, it was kind of like the governor's office called all the shots. And uh, I think a disproportionate share went to some communities, again, to reinforce Mr. Thompson's point, rural communities and upstate communities uh, that were less affluent uh, really struggled to get a proportionate share of the FEMA resources, the, the vaccinations, the people, the personal protective equipment, and what have you. So it, it can, uh, I don't know if you experience that elsewhere, but it can FEMA engage more with local officials? How can FEMA engage more with local officials on the front lines for future crises? And I, I, I would ask you maybe to take that into consideration when you're doing your assessment report, because um, some states did a very good job of proportionally handing out things, and other states was left to the devices of governors and politics. Uh, the, the distribution was not proportional. So if you could uh, uh, maybe comment on that, if you have a comment, if not, take a look at that in your initial assessment report. Follow up. Uh, yes, I have been in a local emergency manager um, in, in New York City, as well as in Aurora, Colorado. And 
you know, I understand the struggles of working through the state to obtain FEMA assistance. And so I appreciate your comment and understand your concerns. Um, and as we continue our process of evaluating how we deliver programs, we'll certainly take that into consideration. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The chair now recognizes other members for questions they may wish to ask the witness. I recognize members in order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority. Members are reminded to unmute themselves when recognized for questioning and to then mute themselves once they have finished speaking and to leave their cameras on so they are visible to the chair. Chair recognizes for five minutes the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning uh, to our new administrator and congratulations for the historic moment that we find ourselves in with you as leading one of the most outstanding emergency disaster organizations in the world. I am delighted to have the opportunity to work with you having served on the Homeland Security Committee since 9-11 and having a great respect uh, for the men and women of FEMA. Before I start, let me offer my deepest sympathy and concern to our friends and neighbors in Surfside, Florida, in the Miami-Dade area. And thank you for being present in that area. Uh, obviously, the members of Congress from that area will also be raising uh, areas of concern, but we certainly hope FEMA is at its maximum in helping that community. Uh, FEMA's responsibility is uh, to prepare for, prevent, respond, and recover from disasters with a vision of a nation prepared. As you all know, I live in the Gulf and I have experienced my neighbors with Katrina taking a quarter of a million people from Louisiana into uh, Texas and as well Hurricane Harvey. My first question would be, um, by how much would the FY 2022 budget's 14% increase in the number of FEMA Stafford Act uh, employees close the gap between the agency's workforce and the employees the agency needs in order to confidently meet the challenges ahead. Thank you for that question. Uh, you know, the 14% increase is going to begin to close the gap. Uh, what we're doing right now is really assessing what is the FEMA that the nation needs and deserves, um, and then trying to determine, you know, what would that structure look like uh, to support that. You know, as I mentioned uh, earlier, we're seeing uh, a year round cycle of disasters and the, the tempo that we're deploying to is much more consistent. And so I have directed my team to conduct this assessment so we can evaluate, you know, what is the appropriate level of staffing to make sure that we can meet these uh, incidents that are now happening much more frequently. Uh, thank you for that. And let me acknowledge the region that I'm in, region six and the leadership that is there. Appreciate. Uh, Tony, I appreciate your leadership in headquarters in Jason Nelson, who's been consistent and a very wonderful liaison to all of us. I want to ask the question, will state and local governments that have a history of dealing with climate emergencies and are projected to continue to experience the brunt of climate change impact be prioritized for competitive grants? Uh, as we lost 151 people in the freeze, I'd be interested in, in that, and I just want to give my Last two questions. I'd like you to comment on the work that FEMA is doing with the unaccompanied children um, that are at the border, since I know that we were engaged with them uh, in some of the issues of site selection. And then I would like to have the response. A 2019 University of Colorado report found that in wake of Hurricane Harvey, homeowners who lived on blocks with a greater share of non-white residents, as well as lower incomes and credit scores had a lower chance of getting approved for FEMA grants. Many of those in my constituents, they still are desperate with um, blue tarps. I just recently visited Louisiana uh, in their storms, and so I'd be interested in the answers to those questions as quickly as possible, and I look forward to following up with you. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, in response to the competitive nature of the grants, uh, we have such an opportunity right now to invest in the uh, reduction of risks that we are starting to see from climate change. And one of the parts of our grant process is to be able to discuss the risks that communities face. And so that is part of the consideration uh, for the competitive grant pro uh, process. 
um, but incredibly important that we work with our communities to help them understand what their risks are so they can communicate that when they do apply for assistance or for the grants. I mean, we are doing targeted technical assistance to help with that and make sure communities can think bigger about how they can improve and reduce the impacts that they're facing. Um, on, the, on the unaccompanied children, uh, you know, FEMA's role is to coordinate and, and our specialty and our expertise is to coordinate um, across uh, the federal government and bring appropriate stakeholders together. And that's what we were asked to do in support of that mission for HHS. Uh, we currently have uh, less than seven people on the ground supporting that mission. Um, and our role was really designed to give additional assistance to HHS as they were standing up their operation. And we have scaled back um, appropriately as they were able to take on some of that responsibility. And then what about uh, not getting fair distribution for poor oh. neighborhoods? Oh, yes, ma'am. Um, so Again, as I, as I talked about in the earlier, you know, our underserved communities across the country, uh, when they get hit by a disaster, it's even more um, devastating for them. And one of the things that I have realized through my time, both at the local level and then coming back to FEMA, is that I believe one of the problems is ensuring people have equal access to our programs as well, that they understand how to get the, the assistance that they need. Um, and so I have directed my, my team here to look at some of the barriers to the access so we can make sure that individuals that are eligible for assistance get all of the assistance that they're eligible for. And the fact that it takes them longer or they don't understand the process is not okay. And we need to make sure that we are bringing our services to the communities and helping them um, get the assistance that they need. Thank you. I wanna specifically work with you on that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Chair, recognize the gentleman from Louisiana for five minutes, Mr. Higgins. I thank the chairman and the ranking member for holding this hearing and to Administrator Chriswell for being here today. After a year of devastating natural disasters, Southwest Louisiana, I am honored to represent, continues to face dire recovery needs. Almost a year after Hurricane Laura's landfall, my constituents are still deep in the rebuilding process and facing new uncertainty as another hurricane season has already begun. And the, the, the federal government is, is largely responsible for that uncertainty. Let me explain. Louisiana's governor issued a formal request to the Biden administration in January for supplemental disaster relief. My office has pushed this request in every way through every channel. However, President Biden and Speaker Pelosi, respectfully, have been somewhat of an obstacle to the swift approval of supplemental disaster funding for Louisiana. The Speaker's office took some responsibility for this delay recently in a media interview stating that the Democratic Congress and the Biden administration are going to, quote unquote, consider the need for supplemental disaster funding for Louisiana. May I say that we are beyond the time for consideration. It's been 10 months. President Biden visited Lake Charles and we thank him for that. He was not there to survey damages, but it would have been impossible to miss those damages. We have repeatedly communicated Louisiana's extreme needs to the Biden White House and to Madam Speaker Pelosi, yet no effort from Democratic leadership has been made to move forward with the supplemental disaster bill. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to submit for the record several letters from stakeholders in Southwest Louisiana and the Lake Charles area, the city of Lake Charles, McNeese State University, Schnault International Airport, West Calcutta Airport, and others. I ask unanimous consent. Objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. These, these letters are regarding major concerns with FEMA following last year's natural disasters, as well as I have several letters sent to congressional leadership out of my office and the White House on the issue. I ask unanimous consent to submit those letters for the record, Mr. Chairman. Objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Creswell. 
you're familiar with Madison in, in, in Federalist 62, he, he wrote that it will be of little avail to the people that the laws are made by men of their own choice if the laws be so voluminous and, and that they cannot be read or so incoherent that they cannot be understood. That's largely reflective of these letters that I just submitted. Uh, my, the people that I represent are begging for help from FEMA to navigate through FEMA's own complexities to access existing funds through existing programs to, for recovery relief. I ask for your commitment to work with the people of Southwest Louisiana to help them navigate through these complexities and to ease that pain. Can I have your commitment from you and your agency, madam, on that? Uh, Representative Higgins, uh, absolutely, you have my commitment. I recently visited Louisiana and met with the uh, political leadership in southwest Louisiana that were impacted by those storms. Uh, we have recently opened up a recovery center that's providing not just assistance to the current storm that was experienced in recent weeks, but also to help them navigate uh, the process for the previous storms as well. And so uh, you have... Yes, ma'am, and I ask for your commitment there in the interest of time. In closing, I'd like to ask for your commitment and assistance to accomplish two things. First, Louisiana delegation has been pushing for the supplemental disaster funding for some time now, many months. I respectfully ask that you amplify that request to President Biden. And second, again, I ask for your assistance with helping local government in my district fully understand the, the, the pre-disaster mitigation grant process and other resources uh, that are available to them. I thank you, ma'am, for being here today. I have several questions that I'll submit in writing, and I, I very much look forward to working with you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I yield. Thank you very much, Chair. I yield back. Uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Landry, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good morning, Administrator. Um, I want to uh, thank you for being here today and uh, for making uh, integrated uh, equity uh, into everything FEMA does uh, uh, one of your first priorities. Uh, before, during, and after disasters, uh, people with disabilities as well as older adults have unique needs, many of which differ substantially from those uh, of the general public. Uh, how do you view the incorporation uh, of these vulnerable populations in disaster management? Uh, uh, of making them a forethought, uh, not an afterthought, uh, particularly in terms of your commitment to equity. Uh, Representative Langevin, I, I really appreciate and thank you for your continued advocacy um, for people with disabilities. Uh, as, as I've stated, equity is, is one of my priorities, um, and that includes people with disabilities. And I have seen firsthand in the disasters that I have responded to on the struggles that the, this community faces when trying to respond to or recover themselves from disasters. Uh, FEMA has made a lot of strides in that area. In 2009, FEMA established the Office of Disability Integration and Coordination. And through that office, they've done a lot of work to increase um, our own agency's understanding of how to make sure our programs are accessible and that we are meeting the needs of the people that have uh, specific needs. And we continue to de uh, deploy uh, disability integration specialists to all of our disasters, um, specifically to make sure that we are understanding the needs of the community and, uh, and addressing them. And so you have my commitment to continue forward with that process um, and uh, would ha be happy to work with you and your staff if there are areas where you think we can improve in that effort. Very good. Well, thank you, Administrator. I I'm glad that you recognize the importance of uh, considering the, the needs of uh, older adults and people with disabilities. I take you up on that offer. I look forward to working with you on that and many other issues. Uh, I do want to uh, call your attention to uh, one other thing, though. Uh, in, in the, a, there was a 2019 GAO report uh, entitled, and I quote, uh, the title of it was FEMA Action Needed to Better Support Individuals Who Are uh, Older or Have Disabilities, end quote. Uh, it revealed that, that FEMA partners, uh, including states, territories, localities, and nonprofits have experienced challenges assisting these populations. So uh, are you aware that, that FEMA has historically struggled uh, to, to support older adults and people with disabilities during uh, and after disasters in part 
due to the lack of planning for these populations? Uh, again, Representative, I, I think that FEMA has done a lot since the, uh, the development of that program in 2009 in bringing on the Disability um, Office of Disability Integration and Coordination. Um, I will go back and look at that report more specifically so I better understand some of the challenges that were identified in that report. Um, I apologize, I'm not familiar with it. Um, but I think that we all have work that we can do to improve uh, our approach and how we deliver services to make sure that we're, we're planning appropriately for everybody. Very good. Well, thank you for your commitment to, uh, to that and to looking at the report. Uh, I, I appreciate it. And uh, I, I know that FEMA will be uh, doing a much better job under your, your leadership, and I, I thank you for that. Um, so uh, you know, I'm currently working uh, with Senator Casey uh, to introduce what we call the, the Ready Act, the Disaster, the Disasters Act. Um, so this bill will support uh, the development of disaster preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation plans that are inclusive of older adults and people with disabilities by creating a network of centers to provide relevant trainings and technical assistance to state and local governments. Uh, it would also expand the National Advisory Committee uh, on Individuals with Disabilities and Disasters so that its membership accurately reflects the diverse characteristics of the disability community and uh, direct the Department of Justice to review the extent to which civil rights of people with disabilities and older adults are upheld during and after disasters. Um, do you believe that, uh, that our bill uh, would help ensure that older adults and people with disabilities are supported in disaster management? Do you think it would be helpful? I don't have the specifics of the bill, but I know that our staff are working together on the development of this, uh, and we're happy to continue to provide technical drafting assistance to help this bill through the legislative process. Thank you. Uh, I'd welcome your, your help on that. Um, I guess uh, last, uh, I wanted to get into, uh, uh, does, does FEMA have any consideration of, of cyber-based disasters that would require a IT-focused assistance? FEMA coordinates really closely with um, CISA uh, at DHS and other members of the emergency management community to increase our preparedness and our understanding of the cyber-related threats. Uh, we do also um, have available $4 million in fiscal year 21 grants to support increasing the preparedness for cybersecurity. And I know that the uh, fiscal year 22 budget is going to add 10 additional employees to the FEMA staff to specifically address and strengthen our own cybersecurity posture. Very, very good. I know my time's expired, uh, but thank you for those answers. I think, you know, uh, you know, fire and police databases were hijacked by ransomware in some uh, uh, state or region. You know, this would allow FEMA to be able to help uh, supplement IT functions such as communications, planning, and operations until they were back on the feet, so I think that's important to look at. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I yield back. Gentlemen, yield yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina for five minutes, Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, Administrator Criswell, for being with us. You may be aware that North Carolina has been hit repeatedly by damaging hurricanes in recent years, Matthew in 2016, Florence in 2018, Dorian in 2019. FEMA's timely assistance is critical to recovery efforts from these disasters. However, we can continue to see very long wait times and delivery of benefits in the public assistance program. I represent uh, one of my counties in my district is Robeson County in North Carolina, one of the most economically challenged in North Carolina. Uh, it's home, by the way, to most of the members of the Lumbee Indian tribe, which perhaps coincidentally remains unjustly without full federal recognition despite the uh, um, commitments of many to supporting that. An elementary school and other buildings owned by the Robinson County public school system there were destroyed in late September 2016 in the first of these three storms, or uh, Matthew. The school system's public assistance claim remains unresolved. In about 90 days, it'll be more than, it'll be five years spanning three administrations without even a final decision about the amount of public assistance to be provided. And FEMA persists in attempting, at least from my perspective, to apply its rule concerning repair versus replacement in a manner contrary to the plain language of that rule. Uh, latest chapter in this saga appeared, I guess, under this administration in the, just the last several weeks. Uh, the chairman and ranking member referred to the disaster declaration processes for rural Americans. 
but the reference also is made to public the public assistance backlog and the public has sort of become i guess even numb maybe to these stories by now but this one seems to be an egregious example of this problem. Uh, when you, your testimony, ma'am, said that FEMA intends to integrate equity into everything we do, but that seems to be an empty promise if FEMA is diverting resources, for example, to uh, facilitating the entry of illegal migrants at the southwest border, despite leaving unaddressed the replacement of a destroyed elementary school in a challenged American county for five years. Uh, what is FEMA's most current assessment of the aging of unresolved public assistance claims from past disasters and, and how are those being addressed? Uh, thank you, Representative Bishop. Uh, it, it's a really um, timely conversation. Uh, there are, you know, several disasters that are currently open across the country um, dating back many years and the recovery process as we continue to see more frequent and more severe disasters becomes even more complicated. Um, and bringing in multiple different recovery sources to assist with that process. Uh, one of the things that we're focused on is trying to um, make sure that we're helping to increase the capacity of our state and local jurisdictions so they can uh, better manage their recovery process as well and we can work together to facilitate getting these projects through. Um, I don't have the specific numbers in front of me to address your question uh, specifically. We can certainly get that to you, but I understand that that is a challenge. Um, and under my leadership, we're going to work on how we can start to improve and expedite that process and streamline it so uh, it does not take as long. Thank you, ma'am. Let me, as long as I'm on the subject about your uh, commitment to integrating equity into everything we do, I. You know, you, you made reference to FEMA's internal diversity, equity, and inclusion programming and using the lens of equity. Is, does FEMA use critical race theory concepts and doctrine in internal training of its workforce? Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is such an important part of, of our internal workforce and being able to have people in leadership positions that they can relate to and they can understand um, just seeing myself in this position really allows women across the country to see what is possible for them. Uh, we will continue to provide uh, anti-harassment training to support our leadership team um, and also work on ways that we can increase the diversity pool of applicants so we can get more diversity within our leadership. Do you know whether you're using critical race theory concepts in that training? Uh, we are not using critical race theory concepts. We are, we are using um, established anti-harassment type training uh, that that has been around for um, decades. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Yields back. Chair, recognize the young lady from Michigan for five Thank minutes you. in the slot. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Administrator, you're welcome here. Congratulations on your confirmation and thanks for taking on this really critical job. I'm from Michigan and we have just experience really extreme flooding um, and it is still raining there. Um, by some measures, we got six months worth of rain in a day. Uh, we got six inches of rain in less than five hours in places like Detroit and Dearborn are literally underwater, flooded highways, cars floating down the highways, flooded basements um, across uh, the country. Um, can you just confirm for me if Governor Whitmer submits a proposal uh, to FEMA to declare a national emergency that you all will move swiftly to confirm it. Uh, Representative, I, I'm familiar with the flooding that's currently ongoing in Michigan and, um, and Michigan is my home state. It is where I grew up. And so I have a lot of uh, attachment there and all my family still lives there. Um, as they're going through the assessment process right now and they submit a request, uh, I will commit to swiftly assessing that and uh, determining if it meets eligibility. Great, well, it makes me feel much better that you're a Michigander. Um, uh, you, won't, you won't leave us hanging. Um, the, the second thing is, you know, a lot of the residents um, who have been hardest hit, a lot of them are seniors, a lot of them do not have access to the internet. And I'm concerned the claims that they're going to file, um, that, that you are requiring people to file, are going to require facility with the internet. Can you also help us understand your plan if we do have a declaration of an emergency to get boots on the ground, people who can help us go door to door, time is of the essence, can you talk to us about that given that not everyone is, is, you know, fluent in the internet. 
Absolutely. I, you know, again, the one thing that we have learned from COVID-19 is that we need to meet people where they're at. And we've seen that in other disasters as well. Uh, FEMA does have a process here, a team um, of, of our workforce that is the disaster survivor assistance teams that, you know, if the disaster is declared, they can go out and help with that, that in-person um, approach. You know, I think as we've discussed already, access to the um, assistance that's available is one of the big barriers that we face. And we have to make sure that we are leaning forward into that to eliminate the barrier access and help meet people where they're at to get them the assistance that they're eligible for. Thank you for that. And then on just the bigger picture, you know, I think everyone who's, who's already asked a question has got um, has, has had to deal with some sort of disaster in their home state, in their home community. We're all, we've all experienced them over the past, um, you know, five, 10 years. Um, and my question, just as someone who used to work at the Pentagon, is really about how FEMA plans. I mean, we know that, um, that we're likely to see, just separate from politics, an increase in the number of storms, an increase in severity of those storms. We're gonna have more historic droughts like we're seeing in the West Coast. So if we, have, if we just take that as a national security and homeland security issue, tell me how FEMA is changing your plans for budgets, for staffing. Um, what, what more can we be helping you with since all of us need FEMA from time to time and that need is gonna go up and not down over the next decade? I, I think that the first piece to that question is the fact that we are seeing um, more severe, more frequent storms that are impacting uh, communities across this country. And we have an opportunity right now to make generational level investments in trying to reduce that risk, reduce the impact that they're feeling from these disasters. And that's one of the first steps that I think we need to do as far as the planning piece of this is making sure that we are working with our communities to help them apply for the mitigation programs that we have to reduce their own impacts. So there's not going to be a need to respond. Um, but as we do respond and, and until we can get mitigation projects in place, uh, we do want to make sure that we have the appropriate staffing, as I mentioned earlier, on this year-round cycle of response now instead of the more traditional peak in the summer. While it still peaks in the summer, uh, our teams are deploying out around the clock now, uh, year-round. And so we are assessing what that looks like for us so we can make a determination on what the right posture is for our workforce um, and happy to, make, to be able to come back to you once we understand better what our needs are. Uh, and, and, seeking your assistance and helping us uh, get to that level of staffing and support. Yeah, I yeah. think this committee would welcome a really sort of forward-looking, bold, interesting concept that, that is appropriate for the disasters that are ahead of us. So thanks very much, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Okay, Chair, I recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Van Drew, for the five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member for holding this hearing today. Administrator Criswell, thank you for being here testifying before the committee. And as we all know, FEMA is a critical agency with the Department of Homeland Security. And I'm grateful for the work that you do and the work that the agency does. New Jersey, as I'm sure you know, is, cons is in consistent, constant peril from natural disasters. Superstorm Sandy, for example, caused nearly $30 billion in economic damages to the state. Obviously, that number does not account for the impact of the storm and the impact the storm had on families who lost loved ones and the countless other tragic implications the storm imposed. Governor Christie stated that at the time that the damages were going to be almost incalculable and that the devastation on the Jersey Shore is probably going to be the worst we've ever seen. Unfortunately, he was correct. Natural disasters have life altering consequences, which is why members of this committee must ensure that FEMA has the tools and is prepared as it possibly can be to respond. Administrator Criswell, I understand that FEMA, and this is very important to me, is updating the National Flood Insurance Program risk rating methodology through its latest system called Risk Rating 2.0. While the program states that one of its goals is to deliver sound and accurate rates, I am concerned that for many of my constituents, they will be forced 
to either pay much higher rates or move, to re or move as a result of not being able to pay. Neither of these are viable options, especially because the cost of living in New Jersey, as I think you all know, is just about the highest in the nation. Is there a strategy in place to assist with re residents who will not be able to afford flood insurance as a result of the updated risk rating methodology? And as part of this methodology, are we going to try to co control the cost as much as possibly can because flood insurance is so important to so many, yet so very expensive. Representative Andrew, thank you for that question. You know, under the current pricing system, uh, NFIP policyholders uh, share the burden to the cost of the insurance premium. And under risk rating 2.0, uh, that burden now is going to be shifted to those and based on an individual's individual homeowner's risk. So under the current system, all policyholders would see an increase in their insurance premiums um, going forward. Under the new system, those that don't have as high of risk will actually see a decrease in their policies. Um, but there will be some that will have an increase. Uh, on your point of are we going to control the cost and make sure that we have um, an affordable way to do this, uh, this, this is a new methodology and we are committed to an affordability framework um, and we have uh, put that in our fiscal year 22 budget um, to help home, homeowners um, who can't afford this new increase do that. But we're also doing this in a phased approach. Uh, homeowners that are going to have an increase in their flood insurance rates will not experience an increase until next year, until April of next year, and it's capped at 18% per year. And then there's also going to be a maximum cap. Once they reach the maximum amount of the insurance policy, it will not go up any further after that. Um, but would welcome the opportunity to continue to work with Congress on the affordability framework so we can make sure that uh, everybody can afford the insurance. Well, 18% is a whole lot um, still to me, and I, I imagine that you would think it is too, and, you know, concerns me a great deal. It's easy for all of us to, you know, to have these conversations here, but obviously when you get back in your district and you tell people something's going to go up 18% uh, at a regular level until a certain point, we're not going to be happy folks. And I also know that you know that it's going to be a real interesting conversation because we been through this before, who is really more at risk or not, and, and what methodology is used and what parameters are used. Uh, this is a, an area of continual agitation and concern, and you know it, it's important because uh, the economic growth of certain areas of this country, and it's not only oceanfront like I have in Bayfront, but it's also rivers and other areas, as you know, and if these folks with everything else that's happening get hit too hard by FEMA and these costs, uh, it's going to be tragic. So it's, it's a really, really big issue. And I really appreciate your work. I'd love you to come to New Jersey sometime. I'm sure you've been there. Everybody's been in New Jersey at least once, but uh, just see some of the challenges we have and be certainly glad to take you around and really show you what's going on. But I just, if there's a concern level from a zero to a hundred on this issue, I'm at a hundred. Uh, just to let you know, and so are other people. You don't hear a lot about it now. Wait till those 18% increases come forward. You're going to get so much noise, it will be unbelievable. New Jersey people are so loud, believe me. Um, I think I, have time. Time. Oh, yeah, I yield back my time. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Chair yeah, recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, thank, thank you uh, for, uh, uh, Madam uh, uh, Administrator, um, for uh, for being with us today. Uh, the chairman and uh, Mr. Katko uh, raised the issue that I'm uh, also very much concerned about, so I won't go through it. Uh, but, and I think you're certainly aware, you know, we uh, the Missouri River is the longest river system in the country only by a little short uh, 100 miles from the uh, Mississippi River, longer than the Mississippi River. So we're gonna have problems every single year. Uh, and and, and that, that $8.9 million damage threshold is a problem. I represent 
uh, a, a farming community all along the Missouri River, uh, and, and it is just devastating. You get a town like, uh, you know, uh, uh, probably uh, Aroa uh, with 800 people, and if you wipe out all, all of the downtown area, you may not go to $8.9 million. And, uh, and, and, uh, and yet the, house, the town is, is devastated. You've already heard that. I'm not going to uh, uh, bring that up again. I do need to say, I, I, you know, I'm not sure what I, I'm, um, I'm going to try to find out t today. I had said I was going to do it earlier, whatever this uh, racial theory is, I, I have, but, which I've never heard of. I have a master's, but I guess I, I you know, I'll, I'll try to find out what it is. I'm, it's kind of confusing to me. I never, you know, never. I heard of it. I think about a month ago, but and I'm not sure if FEMA is uh, in charge of the racial stuff. So I don't know. But I don't know if they changed the, your your job description. But anyway, what I want to talk about though uh, uh, is uh, that uh, the vac vaccination effort in rural communities. Um, I, uh, as I said, I represent a large rural community in Missouri. Uh, and they, you know, uh, my rural area is a hot spot, one of the hottest spots in the nation uh, for COVID-19, uh, particularly as it relates to this new uh, uh, Delta variant. Uh, and uh, I, I'm hoping that with this dangerous uh, increase uh, in, in rural America, in my district in particular that I'm talking about, uh, can you give, give, uh, give us any kind of update on how FEMA is uh, being involved in uh, in local communities with uh, the vaccine distribution. So. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, FEMA has had a strong role in the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine and uh, really played a significant part in getting America vaccinated. Uh, we did this by uh, supporting over 2,100 community vaccination centers across the country with either resources, funding, or personnel. And we also established 39 federally run uh, community vaccination centers. And the federally, the federally run centers that we established, we worked really hard and close with the state and local officials to identify where they needed them, where they wanted them placed, so we could reach those underserved communities. And it's a real success story. Uh, of all of the vaccines that we delivered through these, uh, nearly 60% of our vaccines were administered to underserved uh, populations. Uh, all of those centers currently, uh, the federally run centers have been closed, uh, but we are still supporting uh, local jurisdictions through their established centers, as well as mobile vaccination units that we have in different areas and available to deploy. Um, and is, as we see uh, the changes with the Delta variant, if the need arises, FEMA is ready to uh, reestablish any assistance that we need in case we need to continue to get the vaccinations um, out there. Okay, I think my time is probably running down. So thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Chair. Recognize the young lady from Iowa, Ms. Miller Meeks, for five minutes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Also, uh, thank you, Ranking Member Katko and Administrator uh, Tripo, for being here today. Um, FEMA uses the phrase locally executed, state managed, and federally supported. Um, this concept requires all of us to have. Um, actual um, capability uh, and um, depth at every single level. Uh, in the past, I've asked FEMA as they set up vaccination clinics, uh, the level of their uh, uh, health personnel and emergency personnel. And given that FEMA is not, uh, you know, does not have expertise or scientists or health personnel as part of your uh, personnel, uh, can you explain to me or discuss with me uh, how the how the chain of command and how the delegation of responsibilities works? Did you work with the Assistant Secretary of Pandemic Response, uh, the CDC, HHS, local public health? Um, who should be the head agency when we're dealing with a pandemic? And do we need to rethink how um, you know how to score true readiness at the state, uh, local, tribal, and territorial levels? Uh, FEMA 
the, the phrase that you mentioned, federally supported, state managed, locally executed, I think is an important concept for us to, to bring up. Uh, all disasters, I've been a local emergency manager, they start and end with the local jurisdiction. Um, and that's the locally executed part. And the state and the federal government uh, need to be part of that process to make sure that they're successful. Uh, the federal government does that in a number of ways by making sure that we're increasing their capacity to be able to perform their mission. When it came to supporting the, uh, the vaccination effort or supporting the COVID-19 response in general, um, coming from my own experience in New York City, it, it truly was a, a collaborative approach of making sure that uh, the federal government, while they're supporting, they understood the needs of the local jurisdiction and letting the local jurisdiction set the planning uh, assumptions for them for the assistance that they were going to provide. And I think that's a really critical piece of making sure that, again, that the federal government is supporting the actual needs on the ground of what the local communities say that they have. When it comes to the federal coordination, uh, that's where FEMA is an expert, right? We, we can bring in all of the federal partners. Uh, we're very good at coordinating the stakeholders and bringing the appropriate people together to support a response. And that's what FEMA did during the response to COVID-19. Um, I think we have an opportunity to see where we need to build capacity across the federal government for certain disasters. Um, when they don't squarely fall into the disaster response role that FEMA typically does um, and would be happy to uh, to work with you as, as we continue to have that conversation. And, and then given the scientific and medical nature of this particular uh, uh, national emergency, who was responsible for messaging? So as a physician and a former director of, uh, of the Iowa State Department of Public Health, there was confusing uh, confusion in the messaging. So was that the responsibility of CDC? Was that the responsibility of ASPR? Uh, the messaging was critically important through all this. And as you know very well, you know, the the stuff we learned about the COVID-19 virus changed on a regular basis. Um, as part of the, the leadership role that FEMA ended up playing, it, we had HHS experts and medical experts embedded with us as part of that operation. Um, because as you stated, we don't have that level of expertise. And so it was truly a coordinated approach. Um, I would always defer to the message to be those that are the experts in that message, and then FEMA can help amplify that message. Well, thank you. And then during disasters, FEMA moves resources from unaffected areas to affected areas. However, the COVID-19 pandemic affected the entire nation almost simultaneously, which led to significant supply shortages of personal protective equipment and other necessary supplies. A report published by FEMA in January found that in order to mitigate further supply shortages, FEMA should establish a long-term strategy for engaging with the private sector. How has FEMA engaged with the private sector to address resources and supply shortfalls. We learned so much through the COVID-19 pandemic and the critical and often fragile nature of our supply chain and where we depend on things. And, and we were able to put in um, some new methodologies, working really closely with the private sector to make sure that we were meeting the needs of first responders. But it is the first time, as you stated, with disasters across the country that we really faced a resource shortage um, at this level. Uh, we are working closely with the private sector to establish better relationships and understand how we can bring them in better. Uh, we can never replace the resources that the private sector brings to bear to support disaster response. And so we need to understand better what their capabilities are. And we are having ongoing conversations with different sectors across the private sector to make sure that, that we understand how to get them back up online faster, but also how they can support us in our response. And those conversations are ongoing. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I yield back my time. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes the gentlelady from New York for five minutes, Ms. Clark. Thank you, Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member Echo, for holding this critical hearing on the state of our emergency management preparedness. Thank you as well to Administrator Criswell for joining us today, offering testimony, and let me also congratulate you on your recent confirmation. I know firsthand the excellent hard work and diligence that you have exhibited as our emergency manager commissioner in New York City, and I have full confidence that you will lead FEMA with the same steadfast dedication. As you are aware, the climate crisis is not only an existential threat to our planet, it also presents a major and immediate danger to our communities. Like so many Americans, I watched in horror last year as wildfires and storms ravaged our nation, 
Unfortunately, the weather predictions for this year are equally as alarming. Back home in my congressional district in Brooklyn, New York, many of my constituents are still struggling to recover from the devastating impacts of Superstorm Sandy that flooded people's homes and inflicted permanent damage to our critical infrastructure. The plain and simple truth is that climate change has fueled a troubling rise in extreme weather disasters and events over recent decades, making FEMA's job of protecting Americans more critical yet more challenging than ever before. And that's why I'm astonished that, that when the Trump administration in 2018 took unprecedented steps to ignore science and remove the term climate change entirely from FEMA's strategic plan, not even the term sea level rise made it into the final document. To me, this isn't just a matter of words. Omitting climate change from the strategic plan represented a broader attempt by the previous administration to play with people's lives in the name of partisan politics. Administrator Criswell, under your leadership, what steps is FEMA taking currently to reincorporate climate change into its strategic plan and throughout the agency more broadly? Thank you for that question. Uh, we are seeing uh, an incredible rise in the number of disasters, the severity of disasters, and how rapidly they're intensifying like we've never seen before. And this is a direct result of our changing climate. And we have to be deliberate and brave about our approaches to reducing the impacts that we're seeing from climate change. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, we have a number of mitigation grant programs that uh, are a first step in helping communities reduce future threats and future impacts from climate change. Um, but we're also taking a look at where do we need to be more proactive in our own efforts here. Uh, FEMA has established a climate enterprise steering group uh, composed of components or members from across our agency to take a look at all of our programs to see where we need to be more deliberate and aggressive in our approach to climate change. And this group is also part of the uh, DHS Secretary's Climate Action Group so we can coordinate our efforts. Uh, FEMA has a strong role to play in fighting the climate crisis. Um, and this is the first step in, in us being able to accomplish that. Thank you. The previous administration's failure to act on climate change is exactly why it's so important that Congress take bold action now to tackle greenhouse gas emissions and protect the American public from future climate impacts. That is why I recently introduced legislation with Senator Markey, H.R. 744, the FEMA Climate Change Preparedness Act, which would help FEMA address the natural disaster implications of climate change. Among other provisions, my legislation would direct FEMA to perform an assessment on the natural disaster risks that climate change poses on our nations, as well as on our capacity to prepare for and mitigate climate impacts. Administrator, is this something that your agency is currently looking into? And do you, is this something that your uh, agency is currently looking into? And do you think that such a national assessment could be a useful undertaking? Uh, I believe that we have an obligation right now to be looking at the future risks that we are going to face. Uh, a lot of our efforts, not just at FEMA, but across the emergency management community have often focused on historical risk. Um, but we really have an opportunity and, a, and an obligation, frankly, to look at the future risks that we're facing and make sure we understand them and are investing in mitigation to reduce the impacts from those risks. Um, so I, I do believe that it's important for all of us to have that mindset as we go forward. Well, uh, Rita, I look forward to speaking to you in depth about this legislation and look forward to supporting your work in this endeavor. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. General Lady, we yield back. Uh, Chair recognizes the young lady from Tennessee, Ms. Harshbarger, for five minutes. Young lady needs to unmute herself. Still not quite hearing it. Up. 
it says you're unmuted now. Maybe you can. We're having some technical difficulties. Uh, we'll go to Mr. Clyde for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing. And um, thank you, Administrator Chriswell. I appreciate uh, you being here and, and providing the information uh, that you have. Uh, in March of this year, FEMA was deployed to help address the surge in illegal migrants at our southwestern border. Um, Secretary Mayorkas has routinely stated that he would not say we have a crisis at the su uh, southern border, yet he deployed our nation's emergency response agency, FEMA. So, ma'am, how would you describe the situation at the southwest border? Uh, FEMA's role in the southwest border is, again, part of what we are really good at. Uh, we are good at coordinating across federal agencies. Um, and in this case, we came in to help HHS and CBP with the execution of their mission. Uh, we only had a very small number of people that deployed in support of this mission. Um, and it was from a coordinating standpoint. Okay, so, um, but FEMA is only engaged when you have emergencies or crises, is that not right? So they would not have been engaged if we didn't have an emergency at the southwestern border? Again, FEMA, they're good at coordinating federal agencies for any type of an event or an incident, and we often do this for planned events um, as well as disasters or emergency responses. And so it's that coordinating capacity that FEMA brings in to support agencies in helping them establish their operational capability. Okay, so would you or would you not call it an emergency at the Southwest border? Um, again, FEMA's role was really just to coordinate the, the federal government and- the I'm not gonna answer my question. All right. So FEMA's budget is already stretched pretty thin. Would you agree that the situation at the border has taken away resources from FEMA that could be better utilized elsewhere? Uh, the role that FEMA played in that mission was very limited uh, and we never had more than a hundred staff deployed at any given time. And currently uh, we have less than seven people or approximately seven people that are still supporting the coordination. Um, and, and that is a small number of people compared to, to what we um, have available. Okay, so would your office be willing to provide us a written statement concerning the extent of your agency's mission at the border so that we and the committee can review how the border crisis has impacted your operations? Yes, I'll have my staff get that to your team. Okay, great. Um, so what funding from FEMA has been allocated to date to address the housing or the processing of illegal migrants? Has any? Uh, FEMA is actually getting reimbursed from HHS for our support. Uh, there's been no funding allocated from the Disaster Recovery Fund in support of that mission. Okay. Uh, how much has FEMA spent already, though? Uh, I, don't ha I don't have those numbers. Um, we certainly can add that to the report that we give you. Okay. Um, there have been uh, uh, articles in the news that the $86.9 million non-compete DHS contract to family endeavors um, is under a microscope now to see whether or not it was proper. Uh, is FEMA helping ICE, HHS, or any other government agency um, with the contract? Um, sir, I'm not familiar with that contract, and our role, again, in supporting that mission is to help coordinate uh, the federal family that is uh, involved. Okay. All right. Um, with, uh, with that, um, that's all the questions I have. I thank you for your uh, support of um, the crisis at the southern border. Uh, we need to get that fixed, and um, I, with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes gentleman, gentleman lady from Las Vegas, Ms. Titus, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and it's nice to see the administrator again. We just visited with her in subcommittee that oversees FEMA. So thank you for being with us once more. Uh, I just want to ask you about something I raised with the secretary, so I won't belabor it, but it's about do I see funding? Uh, the, the president's budget proposed a $15.3 million decrease in the OIC funding, and I know that the criteria has been changed to focus on 
domestic terrorism, and that makes this program even more important for communities like I represent Las Vegas. So I appreciate a commitment to try to work with me to be sure that we get the full funding or it remains a, a good resource and an effective one as we move into kind of a new emphasis or a new direction. Uh, UASI and the Homeland Security Grant Funding has done such an amazing job at building the capability and preparedness of our state and local jurisdictions. Um, and as we saw in the early days of the program, it was really about building a lot of capability. And, and what we have seen over the past several years is that much of the, the requests that are coming in are for sustainment. And so the adjustments to the program themselves um, are minor um, and we do not feel will impact uh, the ability to sustain the capabilities that have been built. Um, but as you stated, uh, the secretary has also asked us to take a look at how we are evaluating risk in jurisdictions and uh, our team is doing that now uh, so we can make sure that we are addressing the emerging threats that we're facing. Well, thank you. I appreciate that because it's really important to us in a place like Las Vegas where we have to keep our residents protected, but also 40 million visitors who come every year and they're, and they're coming back at a ra rapid pace. Uh, I'd also ask you that uh, whenever the president grants a governor's request for FEMA's individual and household programs following a disaster, it can currently provides very little assistance in the disaster area for people who were uh, with, without homes before the disaster hit. And now their situation is even worse. In Las Vegas, we have a rate of 228.6 per 100,000 people who are in this situation. So you see it a lot across the Southwest. People go where it's warm, where they can survive. Our nonprofits do a lot of good work. Our local governments try to. But I wonder if uh, there's some way FEMA and its new emphasis on equity and resilience could have a plan to, for these folks as well. Uh, FEMA's programs and the ind individual households program, uh, you know, is designed to help people that have been impacted by disasters. Um, the programs themselves aren't designed to make them whole. Uh, they do provide assistance to help with the temporary repairs. And if they are not homeowners and they're renters, um, with some temporary lodging as they find new, new assistance. Um, I, I think if I'm understanding your question specifically, maybe more about the homeless population, um, and these programs are not designed uh, to support that. However, we do have the um, emergency food and sheltering program, which is one that is run by FEMA that can assist local communities. And that grant funding is available to help them uh, with that, that uh, the homeless situation. And I'm happy to, to get your constituents um, in touch with the people that run that program to see if there's a way that that can help. That would be great. If we can reach out and get more information to uh, help these folks in Las Vegas, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you, Administrator. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Chair, recognize, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida for five minutes, Mr. Jimenez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, also I want to thank uh, the ranking member, Katko. Uh, Ms. Criswell, it's uh, good to talk to a uh, fellow former firefighter and fellow emergency manager. Uh, I served as a firefighter with the City of Miami and also the emergency manager for the City of Miami, so it's really good to talk to you. Uh, you stated that uh, that uh, storms are getting more frequent and more severe. Uh, do you have, can, could you su uh, submit some data to my office uh, on the number of landfalling hurricanes since the year 1900 and their severity uh, so that I can, uh, I can look at that data and see if in fact that's true? Uh, yes, Representative, we can certainly get you that information. Okay. Um, Uh, flood insurance is, uh, you know, remains a, a big issue in my district. And uh, what, um, what you, you spoke about certain caps for the flood insurance program. What are those caps going to be? Is that by region or is there a hard cap nationwide for the flood insurance program and cost, cost to the homeowner? 
Yeah, so, so the, the new uh, risk rating 2.0 program is uh, based, their insurance rates are based on their individual risk and uh, with an increase that is not to exceed 18% per year. Um, again, based on the individual homeowner's risk, there is a certain amount of um, premium that they will pay as a cap. And again, based on their individual risk, um, and that is, um, once they reach that, under the current program, there is no limit, but under the new program, there is. I mean, is that, but that is, so there's not a hard cap nationwide. It's, not, it's based on the individual property? Or how, you said yes. you said yeah, there's a cap. So what is that? Describe yes. that for me. And, and yes. really quick, because I only have five minutes. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe two sides of this. There's a 18% cap per year that their rates can't go up more than 18%, which is set by Congress. Got and it. Then, there's a maximum amount of what their insurance policy will be. And when they reach that, it won't go any higher. I know, but that, I mean, again, the question is, is that on an individual property or is it a nationwide cap that no insurance policy can be, say, more than $5,000? No, it's based on their individual risk for their home. And so that could be, theoretically, that can be $50,000, $100,000, $200,000. It all depends on the, on the home itself. It does depend on the home itself, um, but we certainly can get you more specifics on that. Okay. All right. Um, by the way, I want to thank uh, FEMA for the response to the Surfside incident. That's uh, that's a town that's a, a town that uh, used to be the mayor of that county. Uh, so thank you. Uh, how many USAR teams does FEMA have in support right now? Uh, currently, the two teams that are located in Miami and Miami-Dade are part of the national system, and they were the first teams that were involved. Um, again, it's a real good example of how important these teams are to be embedded within the first responder community so they can respond quickly. Um, so those two teams are already activated, and we have additional teams that we are working right now with the local incident commander to determine. I, 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 I know all that. Ma'am, I know all that. I mean, I actually created the second team, okay? I want to know how many teams you have in the system. Uh, that's the question. Oh, how in many the teams are there in the USAR system? Yeah. Um, how many? I believe I, I don't have the exact number right in front of me, sir. I'm sorry. I can get that's that. Good, that's fine. Okay. That's 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 okay. fine. All right. Um, now, when it comes to hurricane mitigation, uh, we have more communities, more people living on the coast now than we did, say, in the year 1900. Uh, when you say that there are more, you know, their severity of storms are, and their frequency, are you talking about the actual number or are you talking about the dollar amount of the damage that they cause? So I think it's both, right? I think that we're seeing more billion dollar disasters than we've seen in the past. We're seeing um, more storms brew, uh, more hurricanes in the Atlantic. I mean, we're seeing an increasing number of wildfires across the West. And so I think it's a combination of both. Well, I mean, you're being a firefighter, you know that fire needs three things. It needs oxygen, it needs an ignition source, and it needs fuel. So how does, how does climate change factor into those three things? For the wildfire season, and the increase in the number of wildfires that we're seeing is the fact that the, the vegetation is more dried out than it has been in the past, which increases its ability to have the ignition source more quickly. Okay, but it could also be that, uh, that there are, there's, there's lax uh, management of those forests and that they're not being cleared the way they should be, because you and I both know as firefighters that uh, uh, that if you take away the fuel, you won't have these kinds of fires, right? Exactly. That's the, the mitigation that we talk about in trying to reduce the impact, right? So the more that you can uh, mitigate the potential impacts that you're going to see, um, the less that you're going to uh, have to respond. Right. We can't take away the oxygen and we can't take away uh, the ignition source. You know, that's, that's problematic. I mean, we try to. At the end, it's always about the fuel. And the fuel is the vegetation. And if we start clearing that out, we may actually start to see lessening of these devastating forest fires. Could you agree with that? Um, I could agree with that. Okay. So what are we doing to has, what are we doing? Has expired. My time? Thank you very much. And I yield the rest of my time, which is zero. Thank you. Okay, I recognize the old lady from Florida for five minutes, Ms. Demon. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and Administrator. It is great to uh, see you again. Uh, as a native Floridian and former first responder, 
I am no stranger to responding to and living through uh, disasters. But as you know, Administrator, we find ourselves in um, unfamiliar territory with the tragedy in Surfside, Florida. Um, we are certainly, our thoughts are with the victims, the families, our first responders, and I'd like to thank you and your workforce for immediately deploying to South Florida, being there uh, on the ground. I also wanna commend you on the strong partnership that FEMA has and has had with state and local emergency responders. We know that it, it is essential to preserving, protecting uh, life, and it is appreciated, I believe, by all here today. Uh, Administrator, the 2020 Atlantic hurricane season was the most active and the fifth costliest Atlantic hurricane season on record. The season was so active, in fact, that we ran out of names and had to use the Greek alphabet. This year, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has predicted another active season, as you all know. In fact, we have already seen up to three hurricanes from the Atlantic. What hurricane season, with hurricane season in full swing, and, and I know we, we talked somewhat about this today, but you know, COVID-19 was also a curveball uh, with all that you have to juggle as well. So with the season in full swing, how are you balancing these many times unpredictable national disasters along with still being pretty much involved in the response to COVID-19? It's a great question. And uh, our hearts do go out to those that are, are still suffering in Miami right now. Um, and as we see, you know, the, the threats that we're facing continue to change. Um, our normal cycle of disaster response isn't just in the summer anymore. It, it's really year round. And so as we prepare for this season, for this uh, peak that we'll see over the summertime, we, we've done a very deliberate effort to reduce the number of staff that we have deployed to some of our ongoing operations uh, and make sure that they have the opportunity to rest and get reset so we have the appropriate levels to respond to what we might see over the coming months. Um, but we're, we're now taking a big look at what is it going to be for us in the future and how do we want to start to posture ourselves for this more year-round response. And we are doing an assessment to see what it would take for us to build a true readiness cycle that can support a continuous rotation of personnel so they have the adequate rest and recovery they need. And we always have a number of sufficient personnel um, to support these emerging threats that we continue to face. Thank you so much, Administrator. FEMA has historically had challenges with this disaster contracting workforce levels. In its 2017 after action report, FEMA indicated that its disaster contracting workforce was strained due to the unprecedented number of contracting actions that had to process during the 2017 hurricane season. This is understandable considering FEMA obligated 4.5 billion for the 2017 disasters, whereas in the three fiscal years before then, you only had to obligate about 1.3 billion. To date, as you know, FEMA has obligated nearly 48 billion in response to COVID-19 alone. This is astronomical compared, of course, to previous years. Where does FEMA's contracting workforce level stand now? And does FEMA have the workforce it needs during the 2021 disaster season? Uh, the contracting workforce is such a critical part of what we do uh, because we need to make sure that we have um, the right tools and the people to execute those tools to support disaster response. I don't have the specific numbers of our contracting workforce. I'm happy to have my team get back to you. Um, but we are looking across all of our cadres where we have seen a reduction in the number of personnel in doing some concerted efforts to make sure we're recruiting quality people to come in and serve what I think is the best agency the government has. And finally, Administrator, with the limited time I have, I do realize that um, our human beings are the most precious resource. Sometimes you may not always feel like it, uh, but human beings are the most precious resource uh, that we have. We know that FEMA ranks 322 out of 420 agencies in terms of employee morale. I know the chairman talked a little bit about the workforce. Could you very quickly explain some of the steps you were planning to take to address specifically employee morale? Uh, the workforce is my number one priority. Uh, we have such an important mission that we can't fail at. And the way to do that is to make sure that we have 
a qualified, trained, and supported workforce so they can execute their mission. Uh, we've done a number of things to, to reach out to our employees, and I think one of the biggest things that we've done is created these employee resource groups uh, where we get input from our employees on what their needs are and how we can better support them in accomplishing their mission. Uh, we're also going to continue to make sure that we have um, enough personnel and we provide the right training and resources and support that employees need to conduct their jobs effectively and efficiently. And, and the other piece to add to that is, is making sure that our workforce is diverse and inclusive and so we can represent the people that we serve. Imagine that. Thank you so much, Administrator. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. No, I yield back. Chair recognizes Ms. Harshbarger from Tennessee for five minutes. Uh, we can't hear you still. Yeah. We are going to come back to you again. Uh, Chair recognizes uh, Ms. Turner from Kansas for five minutes. Can you unmute yourself, Mr. Laterna? I see you going on and on. Well, uh, we'll go back to Florida. Uh, Ms. Kamet for five minutes. Can y'all hear me? We got you. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Val laughing. Oh, man. Well, I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. And uh, good to see you again, Administrator Chris Well. Um, I'm going to jump right in on questions because I've got a lot and I don't think I'll be able to make it through them all. So going to start with um, the first question being your uh, FEMA all hands on deck, meaning you identified employee burnout as one of the major issues. And we talked about that last week. You had mentioned the importance of workforce readiness in your testimony. And then again, when we were chatting on Friday. Now, I had asked this question to Secretary Mayorkas. Uh, a couple weeks ago and again uh, several months ago and I, I'm just kind of looking for some some clarity on this when I had asked if FEMA had the resources that it needs to effectively respond to the pandemic the border crisis and upcoming storm season at that point he had stated that FEMA had every resource um, that it needed in order to do that do you agree with the secretary's assessment that FEMA is not in need of any additional resources? Uh, so as we prepare for this season, uh, we have the resources that we need to support the, the ongoing responses that we're currently running as well as what we expect. I think as we discussed and we're seeing this uh, year round response to disasters and new emerging threats, we're doing an assessment to see how we can better prepare and have a, a stronger readiness cycle that gives our employees more opportunities for rest and reset um, so they're not deployed so much continuously. Okay, so just to summarize, yes, FEMA has all the resources that it needs to do the job, the workforce, everything, personnel, border crisis, pandemic, incoming Delta variant, uh, tornadoes, hurricanes, wildfire season, everything. I, I believe that we are well postured to support that. Um, we do have a request for additional resources in our fiscal year 22 budget as well um, to help increase that readiness capability. Okay. Now, you guys are seeing the distribution of $2 billion in COVID-19 related funeral assistance. And this is the largest funeral assist assistance program that FEMA has ever handled. And as of June 28th, approximately 447 million has already been distributed to 66,000, almost 67,000 people. Now, what are we doing to make sure that the aid gets to those that are truly in need um, in this very tough situation and that there aren't bad actors that are working to exploit the system? 
The funeral assistance program is truly unprecedented. It is on a scale like nothing that we have done before. And as we were putting our plan in place for how we were gonna roll this program out, we knew that there was gonna be a lot of opportunities for fraud. And so we did put measures in place to help uh, reduce the potential for fraud. And we're seeing very low incidence right now of fraudulent claims. Um, I would say one of the things that we are doing to make sure that everybody gets assistance as well is we are doing, uh, we are, they're registering through the 1-800 number directly. Um, that also helps to reduce fraud by not going online, but then we have personnel that are talking to individuals and helping them work through the paperwork requirements to provide the documentation needed to get that assistance. Is there any follow-up from FEMA once the applicants go through the process to just it's kind of a trust but verify. Yeah, I mean, that is part of the process, right? So as an individual calls the 1-800 number to get assistance, we work with them to get the appropriate paperwork. We verify that paperwork to make sure that it's authentic um, and then work with them to get the, any additional resources or any additional paperwork they need until they finally get their claim settled. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And um, something else that I had... Um, asked uh, Secretary Mayorkas a couple weeks ago um, that he was going to, um, I think, ask you about was uh, the food, emergency food and shelter program that FEMA has. So I've been to the border a couple of times this year, and I have actually been on a plane where I recognize the migrants uh, that we had picked up with the Border Patrol in the days leading up uh, to my flight. Now, it's my understanding that the emergency food and shelter program uh, that FEMA has, has been supporting the travel costs for these migrants. How much of this program has been expended um, on migrant travel? Uh, as you stated, the Emergency Food and Shelter Program is a, a grant program available through FEMA for non-disaster related expenses. Um, I don't have the specific information. I am aware of the flight that you mentioned. Um, I don't have the specific information about the costs that were spent, but it is something that is eligible through this program as it's administered by, a lo by the local um, volunteer agencies. Could you follow up, because I, I know my time has expired, could you follow up with me on the total number of dollars that have been expended on migrant travel this year? Um, we will certainly follow up on that, and, and I would just add that uh, Congress did appropriate $110 million for this program to assist. Right. No, ladies, time has that, expired. Chair, yeah, I recognize the gentleman from California for five minutes, Mr. Smallwood. Uh, thank, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Administrator. And uh, before I get to my questions, I, I want to thank FEMA for standing up its uh, Oakland Coliseum vaccination site, uh, where thousands of Bay Area residents uh, were vaccinated. Uh, it was a real success. I was able to meet with your team on the ground there uh, early on uh, after having the vaccine. And uh, I would say it's the second best thing that's happened at the Oakland Coliseum this year, other than the third best team in baseball, the Oakland A's. Uh, so thank you to FEMA for that. Uh, but Administrator, uh, my district in California uh, is has suffered uh, from wildfires in the past year, uh, as well as yesterday, we had uh, a 4.1 uh, earthquake uh, in the city of Castro Valley. And so we face a, a range of natural hazards. And we found that climate change is exasperating uh, many of these uh, disasters and the effects. And I know you understand as a former firefighter, the importance of resiliency and pre-disaster pre mitigation. Congressional action over the past few years has emphasized pre-disaster mitigation and FEMA has put a greater emphasis on pre-disaster mitigation through the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program, the BRIC program. A total of $500 million was available in 2020, and President Biden has approved for FEMA to provide $1 billion for this fiscal year. Now, it's been an effective way to support pre-disaster mitigation, but we were only able to fund $500 million of the approximately $3.6 billion requested. So what do you think is the best way to address the demand for pre-disaster mitigation funding. Oh, please. I'm sorry, did you hear that? what I started there with? Okay. I, I didn't, uh, go ahead. I think we weren't unmuted, I apologize. Uh, pre-disaster mitigation funding uh, is a critical component to our ability to reduce the impacts that we're seeing from climate change. 
And we were very excited by the authorities that were given to us in the Disaster Recovery and Reform Act to be able to implement and execute the BRIC program, the Building Resilient Infrastructure Communities Program. Um, as we saw with the first year, uh, it was amazing what the amount of need was that was out there, as you stated, um, with $3.6 billion in applications. And I think where we're going is now that we have additional funding that was available this year, double what we had last year, a $1 billion, we're going to continue to be able to address these projects to do the system-wide mitigation instead of a more incremental approach that we've done in the past. Um, but BRIC is just one of the programs that we have, and so if there's applications that were not um, uh, selected during this program, we also have our hazard mitigation grant program, post-disaster grant, um, that individual or state and local jurisdictions can apply for as well, um, and that comes after every disaster. And we've recently um, also created hazard mitigation funding eligibility for fire management assistance grants which specifically goes to those communities that were impacted by the fires to increase their, their um, ability to reduce risk. Now, Administrator, to qualify for BRIC funding, a state must have issued a major disaster declaration in the past seven years. But as you know, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, every state has been under a major disaster declaration. So has the anomaly of simultaneous major disaster declarations across all 50 states because of the pandemic affected FEMA's administration of the BRIC fund? No, it hasn't. And I, I think it just gives us greater opportunity now to be able to invest in communities across the country to help them reduce the impacts from these threats that we're facing. Great, well, uh, we are going into uh, sadly another fire season uh, on top of that, a drought. And as I said, a reminder yesterday uh, that we are at risk of a, you know, a major earthquake uh, in the Bay Area. And so uh, we need you all more than ever. Uh, welcome aboard on the job. And again, your team on the ground uh, in San Francisco uh, really uh, did an excellent job in getting our community vaccinated. And, and we have uh, over 80% uh, of Alameda County has received at least one vaccine. And, and that is a leader in the country, uh, in part because of FEMA's work. So thank you very much. Gentlemen, yields back. Yes. Uh, chair recognizes. Ms. Hushbarger, again. I, I think we okay, still I've have- Okay, I've got you on the phone line now. Okay. Are you good? Ms. Hushbarger, I, I apologize. The gremlins are still with us. Um, okay. Can you hear me on the phone line? We can hear you on the phone line. Okay. Let's just do it that way. Who knows what's going on? Hey, if it was as easy to fix, I should call FEMA. Maybe they can do that. So, anyway, I just uh, thank you, Chairman and Ranking Member and uh, Madam Administrator. I just uh, wanted to. Uh, talk a little bit about something some of my colleagues have already talked about and that is the uh, like the disaster relief the the disaster declaration some some of these smaller counties i have a small county in unicoi tennessee and they had a flood event in march of 2020 and they just received money as of last month due to that uh, flood that damaged some of the roadways and you know they weren't able to meet their threshold and they finally did the paperwork and my concern even after they were approved it took eight months to receive their money and you know in a small county when you have maybe two employees it takes one of uh, doing this full time in order to do the paperwork to get the money from those uh, disasters and it's all the documentation things like that it, so I just want you to be aware of that, uh, Madam Administrator, that sometimes on these smaller counties, it took over a year to get that money to them, and they have to figure out how they're going to budget that in order to make those road repairs. So that's a concern. And I kind of want to switch gears and talk about our national stockpile problems. Um, and COVID-19 made those very, very apparent, you know, as far as supply chains are concerned. And 
these problems with the supply chain severely impacted the ability of the country to respond to the pandemic and it put our economic and national security in jeopardy. And I can tell you this as being a pharmacy owner, in three weeks, I could not get medications. I couldn't get hydroxychloroquine. I couldn't get the powder to make it. I couldn't get supplements, vitamins. And that's just in a three week period. And that is critical. I, I consider that critical infrastructure as far as the nation goes. It, it is imperative that we have those. Um, and as a nation, we lack a clear understanding of the supply chain outside of the Department of Defense environment. And the public safety industrial supply chain must be comparable to how the DOD manages the defense industrial base. And that includes things like procurement, acquisition, long-term contracting, asset viability, material distribution, and tracking of emergency threats that proactively support supply chain assurance. I guess my question is, um, core capabilities like supply chain security and supply chain risk management have habitually been underinvested in, and how should our nation determine in detail and understand the interdependencies of the public safety industrial supply chain and the impacts it will have on operations if interrupted? What we learned through COVID-19 is truly how, um, as you stated, critical our supply chain is. It is a piece of our critical infrastructure, but really just how fragile it can be as well. Uh, and you know, as we were working through uh, our ability to maximize and support the supply chain to make sure that we could keep resources moving, uh, we learned a lot of lessons about our role and how we can interact with the private sector Think that we have two roles. Uh, one is, you know, how do we during disasters make sure we get the supply chain up and running quickly so they can continue to bring supplies in because FEMA can never replace what the private sector brings to the table. But also, how can then we integrate the, the private sector into our operations to better support the, the initial response needs? Uh, FEMA has started a lot of conversations across the private sector in different sectors, healthcare, housing, and so forth, to see how we can work better together to improve the resiliency of the supply chain, to make sure that we don't have um, or we're reducing any um, potential impacts to disrupting the supply chain. Okay, thank you for that. Um, well, after I've had such microphone troubles, I'll just yield back, Chairman. Thank you. Young lady is very kind. Thank you much. Chair recognizes the young lady from California for five minutes, Ms. Barragon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you for holding this hearing. Thank you, Administrator, for being with us today and all your work. Uh, the Trump administration took unprecedented steps to criticize natural disaster survivors and continuously threatened to deny or withdraw aid to jurisdictions such as Puerto Rico and California while praising and announcing more money for areas that had a large number of Trump supporters. Their actions threaten the recovery process for disaster survivors. While it is the executive branch that carries out various response and recovery programs to help communities rebuild after a disaster, it is Congress's responsibility to conduct oversight to ensure the American people are receiving a fair, effective response from the federal government. It is not only important for the disaster survivors currently putting their lives back together, but for the future survivors who will benefit from a response improved by lessons learned. The Trump administration's politicization of disaster assistance stands against everything we as public servants stand for. Administrator, what effects does the politicization of disaster relief have on affected communities. Uh, start your question, the answer again. We kind of yeah. had a delay. Understood. Uh, disasters that impact communities, uh, they do not discriminate whether you're Republican or Democrat, and FEMA's assistance is not restricted in any way um, based on that. Uh, we provide assistance to communities based on their need. And one of the things that we have learned through COVID-19 is our ability to really better understand and identify our underserved populations to make sure that we are getting them the assistance they need, but also making sure that they understand how to access that assistance. 
Um, and that's FEMA's role. We are going to help people before, during, and after disasters, um, making sure that they get what they need to, to recover uh, from this, from whatever that event was. And do you agree it would be dangerous if we started to politicize who gets disaster relief? Uh, it would absolutely be dangerous. Uh, we should be basing disaster need, um, disaster assistance on the needs of the community and the impacts that they experienced. Okay, well, thank you. How can we assure that never happens again, that we are politicizing the need, disaster need? You know, the policies that FEMA has and the, the Stafford Act that guides our ability to provide assistance clearly sets out how we provide assistance. Um, and as long as we're following the guidance set forth in there, uh, we will be able to continue to provide assistance to all communities that are impacted. Well, thank you. Minister, I also want to thank you for the work uh, that you have done in uh, working across agencies to help at the southern border. Um, I have been there firsthand. I have seen um, what the difference has been um, in getting children out of, uh, you know, Border Patrol custody and into HHS and um, in the role that you all played and how it's been very helpful. So I want to thank you for that. Um, my next question um, is about, uh, you know, reports that the, uh, the sites, the FEMA uh, assisted sites of the mass vaccination centers um, are winding down. They're coming to a close. Um, what is FEMA's role moving forward in um, assisting in the vaccination efforts? And is there any consideration being given on reopening these mass vaccination centers when maybe, say, boosters are going to be necessary for um, you know, the population? FEMA has supported the, uh, the vaccination effort in a, a variety of different ways. Uh, we are supporting uh, approximately 2,100 community vaccination centers across the country, 39 of which were federally run community vaccination sites. Uh, our ongoing support for the 2,100 continues by providing financial assistance, uh, personnel, resources as needed based on what the community needs and how they're doing with their outreach to their populations to get them vaccinated. Uh, we have wound down our 39 sites and primarily that was based on the fact that we saw limited numbers of people coming and more of the population that were going to uh, pharmacies, their doctor's office and other places to get the vaccine. You know, as we look to the future, we will be ready to stand up additional sites if needed. Um, if there is a booster that's required, uh, we remain flexible to be able to support this ongoing effort to get America vaccinated and whatever that might look like in the coming months. Well, thank you, Administrator. Um, FEMA has literally helped save lives by uh, undertaking this logistical challenge of getting the vaccine out. And we have seen the difference that you and this administration have made. So thank you. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I yield back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Returner, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Apologize for the technical difficulties we had earlier. Uh, and thank you to you and Ranking Member Katko for holding this hearing. Administrator, uh, very pleased that you're with us today. We like to say in Kansas that you can experience all four seasons in the same day. Uh, and along with that weather comes uh, disasters with tornadoes, flooding in the wet season, uh, wildfires in the dry season. And we need FEMA to be ready and able to support those communities uh, in Kansas and across our country that are affected by disasters, disasters of all sizes. I also recognize the role FEMA has played in providing resources and relief across the country during the COVID-19 pandemic, which we all hope we're nearing the end of. I have a couple of questions for you. The first is in the president's FY 2022 budget. He includes just over $100 million to support, sustain, and develop new IT initiatives. Given the past issues FEMA has had with safeguarding personal information, could you give us the specifics on the IT initiatives that FEMA will be focusing on? Um, I will certainly have my team get back with some specifics for you, but what I will say generally is that some of the IT initiatives we're focusing on is modernizing our IT infrastructure as well as our grant system so we can make it easier for state and local communities to apply for assistance through that. Uh, those are some very general uh, big picture pieces of our IT infrastructure that we are requesting funding for, um, but I'll certainly have my team get back to you with some specifics. I appreciate that, Administrator. 
since the nationwide emergency was declared on March 13, 2020, there was a lot of confusion initially as to who was leading the response, FEMA or HHS. And as FEMA took the lead, questions remained as to who should be charged with leading and managing federal effort during a prolonged pandemic. While FEMA certainly has the capability to coordinate resources and manpower, what should FEMA's and HHS's respective roles be for future similar events? Uh, it's a it's a very good question. You know, FEMA is very good. What we're what we excel at is being able to uh, collaborate across the federal government to bring the right stakeholders together to solve some of the toughest problems that we've been facing in recent years. Um, I think that we have some work to do to make sure that we are working with our partners across the federal government to better understand what the capabilities are and where the roles and responsibilities need to be delineated. Um, and so I, I, I commit to being able to work across the government, uh, helping to better understand capacity and where the roles and responsibilities need to be defined. Administrator, could you get a little more detailed on that? Uh, do you think that, that that needs to take shape in the form of legislation? Uh, are those conversations that you're currently having now or, or ones that you plan on having in the future? Uh, they are conversations that we're having now as we work with HHS and in our continued response to COVID-19. Um, and if there is a point in time where I think it needs legislation, I'm certainly happy to get back with you and how we would make that happen. As you know, a number of state governors are moving to end their state's incident period for COVID-19 major disaster declaration. Does FEMA currently have a projected timeline for when the COVID-19 major disaster declarations might end? Uh, we are reviewing that currently on when that might happen. Um, it's not going to happen in the very near future. I um, mean, we will make sure that we're providing uh, ample notice for jurisdictions so they understand what the impacts of that might be. I appreciate that. You touched on this a little bit earlier, but if you could go into a little more depth, ending the state's COVID-19 major disaster declarations affect the resources available to states and what resources will still be available to states under the nationwide uh, uh, emergency declaration. After this is over, it would be nice for states to have some idea of what's going to be uh, available to them. Right. We're seeing states uh, end their incident periods or end their, their emergency declaration, and we're having conversations with them through our regional administrators on what that means as it relates to the national disaster, uh, the major disaster declaration, and our ongoing incident period. And so we'll continue to have those conversations. Our regional administrators have been reaching out to our states continuously to help understand some of the guidance and what the future impacts might be as we continue to refine uh, the, the future of the, the disaster declaration. Are you doing uh, personal outreach to, uh, to any of the states or comprehensive uh, calls that governors and their teams are able to participate in, or is it done region by region primarily? Uh, so we like to have our regional administrators do the majority of that outreach, but I have been communicating with the national organizations uh, that bring together the leadership from across the country to answer some of these same questions. Okay, Administrator, I appreciate your time and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Chair, recognize the gentleman from New York for five minutes, Mr. Torres. Good morning, Administrator. Um, you were the New York City Commissioner of Emergency Management. Where those challenges to the cataclysmic challenges confronting health and hospitals during COVID-19. As you know, there may be no health system in the United States that came under greater strain during COVID than health and hospitals. Uh, New York City was the epicenter of the first coronavirus wave and health and hospitals as a safety net health system was the hardest hit not only by the rapid influx, but also by the sheer intensity and complexity of coronavirus cases. FEMA provides reimbursements to quote, expanded medical facilities as you know, health and hospitals had to expand their medical facilities and contract out search staff in order to keep pace with what the New York Times infamously described as a quote, apocalyptic coronavirus surge. And yet inexplicably, FEMA refuses to reimburse health and hospitals for that capacity expansion. Can you explain to me the inexplicable decision to deny or delay reimbursement for health and hospitals? Uh, Representative Torres, yes, I, I was there. It was uh, the most challenging year that I have gone through, and uh, I worked closely hand-in-hand -hand with 
uh, my colleagues at health and hospitals as we were expanding that capacity. Um, it was not just in health and hospitals, but the alternate care sites that we set up across uh, the city to support the, the numbers that we were projecting. Um, I don't have the specifics of the denial that you're talking about, um, but those types of costs um, are eligible costs under the disaster declaration. And so let me get more information about the specifics of what you're talking about. And, and I'll be happy to get back to you with uh, any information. Absolutely. And I just wanna, I wanna read for you a letter from the CEO of Health and Hospitals, Mitchell Cass, to your agency, to you directly. Um, quote, FEMA Region 2 asserts that health and hospital facilities were not expanded in their entirety and that health and hospitals must prove which portions of our systems were expanded versus unexpanded. And then the contracted search staff to only expanded areas in order to be eligible for FEMA funding. As health and hospitals has explained previously in writing and at multiple working sessions with FEMA Region 2, this is neither required by FEMA guidance nor feasible. Moreover, it does not reflect the operational or clinical realities experienced by health and hospitals during the height of the pandemic. Given the terrible volume and intensity of the first wave of COVID, all health and hospital facilities were expanded in their entirety to battle the virus. Everything the CEO said is entirely true. As you know, during the wave, during the early wave of the pandemic, the whole health and hospital system became a COVID emergency center. Mm -hmm. There was virtually no testing. So everyone entering the system was presumed to have COVID-19. It was a severe shortage of testing, a severe shortage of PPE. There were medical personnel with minimal PPE falling ill to the virus, hence the need for surge staffing. And in my view, if the 11 hospitals and health and hospitals do not qualify as expanded medical facilities, then no hospitals in America qualify as expanded medical facilities because no health system was as overwhelmed as health and hospitals. But thank you for reading me that letter. I have not seen that letter yet, um, but I will look into this and see what the specifics are, and, and we will get back to your staff. Uh, quick questions about Puerto Rico. I have concerns about Puerto Rico's electric grid, which was ravaged by Hurricane Maria in recent weeks. Tens of thousands of residents on the island have been left without power. What is the status of the $10 billion allocated for Puerto Rico's power grid? Uh, again, I don't have the specifics on the status of that. Uh, we have a, a strong, extensive team on the ground that's working with the Puerto Rican government uh, to help them as they're going through the recovery process, as well as some of the mitigation efforts that they're undergoing. Um, we will certainly get back to you with the status of, of where we're at with, the, with those projects. And I, are you aware that Loomer Energy, a private firm, has taken over the power grid? Yes. And do you, does FEMA have confidence in Loomer? Uh, we are working closely with the, um, the resiliency group out of the government of Puerto Rico. Uh, they took over early in June. They responded to their first event. It seems like that went well, um, but we're working closely with them and the government to ensure that they have the capacity and capability to support. And what oversight mechanisms are in place to ensure that Luma is held accountable for spending the billions that it will receive properly and efficiently? And, and that will be my final question. Yeah, again, we, we have a, an extensive team that's on the island supporting this ongoing process. Uh, I recently visited Puerto Rico uh, in my first few uh, weeks here on the job to get a better understanding of where they were at with their recovery. And uh, our team is working hand in hand with them to make sure that things are moving and progressing, but also being spent in accordance to the way they're supposed to be. time has, has expired. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan for five minutes, Mr. Myers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, Administrator Criswell, for um, appearing here today. Uh, you know, I, I think during the COVID-19 pandemic, we obviously saw firsthand the importance of emergency preparedness uh, and also having a well-supplied strategic national stockpile for personal protective equipment and other supplies that we need to deal with public health crises. Um, I just wanna make sure that we are learning all the lessons that we can from this pandemic and that we put those towards preparing for crises that may come down the road. You know, typically FEMA can move resources from unaffected areas to affected areas during disasters. Um, 
you know, when you have one region that's impacted or one state, uh, we can surge supplies from others. Uh, when we have something that impacts us nationally, as, as COVID did uh, during a pandemic, um, you know, we saw the significant supply shortages that arose uh, when we had more of that regional uh, impulse rather than something, the assumption that we'll be have, having to act on a national level. Um, you know, along with the strategic national stockpile at the federal level, Michigan maintains its own uh, Michigan strategic national stockpile, which is managed directly by our Department of Community Health. Um, I, I just want to drill down on how FEMA works with state programs and if there are any important lessons to be learned from the pandemic or other steps that Congress can take to help facilitate coordination in the future and a, a, a flexible kind of rotating stockpile approach. So I guess, uh, Administrator, um, to put it directly, how can the Strategic National Stockpile Program and state strategic stockpile programs work most effectively together across a range of disaster scenarios? As you stated, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic was the first time that our resources have been uh, needed across all 50 states and our, and our tribes and territories. Um, and, and it really stretched our ability to move resources from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Uh, I know that state and local jurisdictions have been building their own stockpiles um, for many years. And some of the things that our, our role is, is helping them understand what their needs are, where their gaps exist, um, and help them fill those gaps through, whether it's applying for grant funding that we have or through other resources. Uh, our focus is really to work with the state and local jurisdictions to better understand where their capabilities are and help them to close those gaps as needed through whatever federal resource might be part of that. And, and you mentioned those federal resources. Um, do you believe that FEMA or, or that Congress um, or some play between the two should be incentivizing states that don't already have their own stockpiles to create them? I think that having your own capability that's the first stop right where uh, disasters all start and end at the local level and so the more capacity that we can build at the local level the better they're going to be able to respond and not need support from the federal government um, that level of capacity building is the first step in, in creating a prepared and resilient nation and whatever we can do to help generate that level of capacity building um, i think it is a step in the right direction yeah, uh, you know, and I know on the household level, I mean, one of the recommendations that FEMA gives is, you know, to have sufficient food on hand. Um, I, I think it's uh, um, a week's worth of food is usually that recommendation, but that whole approach of in your pantry, you know, you have you have the canned goods, you put the newest one in back and then take from the front so that you, you have that, that depth, right? Um, you know, we're dealing with a lot of pro products in our strategic stockpile, whether they're masks or ventilators or, or you know, a, a range of additional equipment um, that has an expiration date. Uh, does FEMA work with the states to manage that optimal balance where um, items that may have an expiration date of five years time, you know, are you have a five year window of supplies that get drawn down and replenished um, consecutively, uh, if that makes sense? I mean, do we have that, that mechanism in place to be able to best optimize the efficiency of those stockpiles? I think where our role comes in with that, again, is working with our states to help them understand where their capacity is at and how they can best maintain that capacity. Um, and we provide technical assistance to states that request it uh, to help them work through those level of details. Um, and we will be able to continue to provide that assistance through our National Preparedness Division. Thank you. And just a final quick question. Do you feel um, in your experience that states um, without their own stockpiles are at a disadvantage when it comes to federal assistance? Um, I wouldn't say that they're at a disadvantage when it comes to federal assistance. I think that, again, we're trying to build capacity at the federal, state, and local level. Um, and if there is, through our process of trying to understand that capacity through some of our established practices, the threat hazard um, risk assessment process, we have an idea of where those gaps may exist. And so we can better prepare uh, as we're seeing um, storms or other disasters happen. So we know where those, those, those gaps might be so we can be prepared to respond appropriately. Thank you, Administrator. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you very much. Chair recognized gentleman from Texas for five minutes, Mr. Brinkman. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I have intelligence indicating that a 2020 RAND survey commissioned by FEMA found serious cultural issues at the Agency for People of Color and Minorities. Uh, the survey assessed gender bias, uh, sexual harassment, uh, and uh, gender discrimination. Um, this survey found that 29% of the employees expressed the view that their civil rights were being violated. 20% reported having experienced civil rights violations uh, based on sex. And 18% reported having experienced civil rights violations based on race or ethnicity. So this begs the question, uh, what is uh, FEMA doing to address these allegations? So Madam Administrator, thank you for being with us today. Sorry to rush right into this. Uh, I've uh, been busy with some other committee assignments as well. And if this has already been broached, uh, this issue has been uh, brought to your attention. I, I beg that you would uh, forgive me for asking it twice, but these are things of concern too. It's a very important issue, uh, absolutely. And I'm very familiar with the RAND study that the previous administration commissioned um, as a result of some of the, the um, actions that we found were happening across the agency. Um, harassment at every level, at any level, is not tolerated. And uh, I have worked with my team to better understand where we were at in addressing the findings within that RAND report. Uh, prior to my arrival, they had created a culture improvement action plan to begin that process. Um, and we have recently reviewed that plan, added some more metrics to measure our approach to addressing that and have reissued it out to the workforce so they understand that this is a commitment of mine to make sure that we hear our employees, understand what their concerns are, and we are measuring our progress against addressing those concerns. Um, the RAND study also suggested that we do a follow-on survey, which we have done, and we are right now compiling the results from that survey. Um, but we are going to continue to, to tackle this head-on because this is a, an incredibly important um, issue. Our workforce is our number one priority, um, and that level of harassment and discri discrimination is not going to be tolerated. Well, I greatly appreciate your answer. Uh, let me just add one additional commentary. Uh, the survey reported that 40% uh, were told to drop the gender claims and 42% were told to drop their racial claims. Uh, I, I know that you're, you're doing what you can and you're moving into this area as expeditiously as possible, but that does create some concern that uh, people are encouraged to drop their claims. Uh, any comments that you'd like to give on the, the claims that are being uh, dropped? Uh, that, no, it's a very concerning claim, and I would say one of the things that we did to address that directly was we established an Office of Professional Responsibility, and so this is something that we did not have in the past, um, and now it provides a mechanism for employees to reach out and report misconduct, and we have an actual investigative unit that can address those um, and, and research them and identify the validity of that claim and then take action as appropriate. Well, I do thank you very much for uh, looking into this, and uh, uh, I'm eager to hear what the results are. Um, if uh, at all possible, could you please keep me informed as to how we proceed with it? I, yes, sir. I can sort of track it, if I may. And uh, by the way, I'm going to salute you for a great job being done, so, so it, it's just important that I stay on top of this. Uh, yes, sir. Absolutely. I'll you back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Administrator, for your time today. Um, I'd, I'd like to just ask you a couple of questions to start with. Um, and, and thanks for your service as a fire, firefighter. I understand that uh, uh, that there's a lot of good lessons learned there. Somebody who served in the military, um, you know, I think those types of uh, jobs can really teach us about uh, preparedness. Um, would you say that COVID